Ladies and gentlemen, Anne Solomon is an applied marine ecologist and conservation biologist, and has a deep interest in the ways that humans alter marine food webs and the extent to which these disturbances then go on to modify the biodiversity, the productivity, and the resilience of our coastal ecosystems. There's four different ways that scientists can try and inform conservation and management. We can document how systems change through time. We can attempt to assess the causes of change. We can evaluate the consequences of change. And we can attempt to forecast or predict the outcomes of different policies, like spatial planning policies, like zoning within national marine conservation areas. So with this in mind, we set out to basically identify two major research objectives that we wanted this program to fulfill. The first one was to assess the ecosystem effects of future marine zoning within the to-be-established Guayanas National Marine Conservation Area. Our second objective was to quantify the key ecological processes that drive kelp forest biodiversity, productivity, and resilience. And the way that we did that is we actually started some targeted field experiments. What does Ed Ricketts have to do with Haida Gwaii? Does anyone know? Does anyone know who Ed Ricketts is? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I know who he is. Yeah, he's Doc from uh, That's right, okay, otherwise known as a Doc. Ed Ricketts was a marine ecologist. Yeah, that's right. He was based out of Canary Row in Monterey Bay. And um, he was really good friends with Steinbeck, who wrote The Log of the Sea of Cortez after an expedition that they both did down to the Gulf of California. So what does Ed Ricketts have to do with Haida Gwaii? Well, does anyone know? He was planning a trip up here when he got killed. Yeah, that's right. Ed Ricketts was planning a trip up to Haida Gwaii. He'd actually been up there a couple of times before to explore the intertidal. He's a marine ecologist, was a marine ecologist, and he was planning to go up and to go up with Steinbeck to write another book, The Outer Shores. He died two weeks before that trip. But the interesting thing, and the reason I bring up Ed Ricketts is because the trip out to Haida Gwaii with my collaborators, some of which are here, really reminded me of the Log of the Sea of Cortez because Ed Ricketts and Steinbeck, they traveled on a 38-foot wooden troller called the Western Flyer. This was what got them down to the Sea of Cortez. This is what got us around Guayanas, <laughs> the Victoria Rose. So it was off the Victoria Rose and an 18-foot skiff that we explored the waters of Guayanas and Kelp Forest ecosystems. So what I'm going to do is just show you some pictures to describe what we were doing underwater so you can get a sense of what it's like to be a marine ecologist, an applied marine ecologist, and how we actually collect data, what some of those data look like in terms of photographs. Here's Lynn with a quadrat in hand and a slate, and we would use these one meter squared quadrats to get it, um, estimates of the density of invertebrates along a transect line. This is Alejandro, and he's doing a fish transect. Um, we basically got estimates of fish densities across these sites visually with these underwater surveys, but also by fishing these sites, where we spent time at known depths and known amounts of time catching fish. The fish that we did caught were then used to get a handle on uh, variation in kelp forest food webs. So here you're seeing a copper rockfish and its stomach. I'm going to zoom in on the stomach contents there. There it is. So we, we were trying to get a handle on who eats who. So we could estimate what would happen when some of these predators in the system that are fished recover or places that are heavily fished, what happens when they are depleted. So here you can see a uh, sea urchin, you can see some snails, that circular bit there, that's an operculum for, for one of those snails you see. Here's stomach contents of a lingcod. <laughs> you know, they say big fish eat littler fish. Well, anything that can fit in the mouth of this lingcod oh, will make it in there. So we were getting the handle on food web um, dynamics by looking at stomach contents, but we were also taking little bits of tissue to do analyses on that tissue and to look at naturally occurring stable isotopes. These are natural uh, isotopes of carbon and nitrogen that tell us a little bit about who, <coughs> eats, who is eating who and the flow of carbon and nitrogen through the food web. Okay, so I just described to you what we were monitoring. Here come the experiments. 
So we want to get a handle on the predation rates on urchins. Why? Because urchins are very important grazers in the system. They're like lawnmowers with 100 horsepower Yamaha engines. They eat a lot of kelp. And kelp provides that structure and habitat for fish. It also provides food and it alters the flow of water such that larvae in the water are more likely to settle in different places because it slows that water down. So that's why we're interested in, in kelp and the things that eat kelp and the things that eat the things that eat kelp. So how do we do these experiments? Here are the silly things that marine ecologists get up to underwater. So this is Alejandro. He's got um, probably two pieces of three meter long chain. This is half inch galvanized chain that we would lay down on the seafloor. Here's Lynn and Alejandro laying some of this chain down on the seafloor. And on this chain, we would tether red sea urchins. You can just make out the fishing line right there. And we do this by getting a hypodermic needle and basically um, bisecting the, the test, the, uh, the shell of the urchin, tying a good knot and then zip tying it to that chain. Okay, then what we did is we watched what happened. Who was eating them, and at what rate were they being eaten? Over seven days, we'd go back and check. And this was one of the major predators we were noticing out there. This is a sunflower star, Pycnopodia. You can see that's just crawling over the chain, and you can just make out one of the fishing lines just above there. If you were to grab this Bengal tiger of the sea, a major predator, and have a look underneath, this is what you would see. Just make out the oops, you can just make out the test of that tethered sea urchin. And here's another one where you can just see some of the spines of the tethered urchin. It, basically, what they do is they extrude their stomachs. The stomachs um, go right around the urchin. They use the stomach juices, acids to digest the uh, tissue around the spines. And then that, that is how they actually end up sucking dry these, these uh, sea urchin tests. Okay, so that was predation. We also wanted to get a handle on grazing rates. So you can see here, these are red sea urchins that have pulled down uh, bull kelp, neurocystis, by the blades and are starting to eat it. So how did we measure this? Well, the first thing we did is we grabbed some kelp. This is actually macrocystis, a perennial. And this is Hannah that's harvesting some kelp. Then we would zip tie little number tags around the base you can see six blades here, and they all have little yellow number tags. We dry them as much as we could, and then weigh them. Some of them went into these cage controls. These cage controls basically told us the rate at which um, loss of kelp happened by things other than grazing. So this is what the experiment looks like underwater. So there's our chain. You can see some of the tethered urchins at one end. And here's Alejandro putting a control at one end of that chain. And here's a photograph of the experimental blades that are out there available for urchins to start grazing away. So 24 hours later, this is what we saw. Here's a site where there was just a little bit of grazing. You can just see some bites taken away from these kelp blades. <coughs> Here's a site where there was moderate grazing. And here's a site where there was very high grazing. And if you take a close look, you can actually see that Aristotle's lantern of these urchins, the mark that they leave behind on the blade. And here, the bald, the maticist. You can see that the Aristotle's lantern actually looks kind of like a star, and you can see it right there. OK, so that's just to give you a sense of some of the science work that we do underwater. Um, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of skill, and it's fantastic to have such great collaborators. <coughs>